here. Okay. So that's the paradox of thrift. Now, I'm going to now show you the reasons for crashes, beginning of the reasons for crashes. And this is with a model which has doesn't have explicit money in it yet. It's just uh, implicitly having money there by having debt. So what I've added here is that with, with the previous model I showed you in this particular software package, I didn't have banks in the system. And I had firms investing all their profits. Now, in reality, firms invest more than their profits during a boom and less than their profits during a slump. Okay? The level of investment is related to the rate of profit. So the high rate of profit, their expectations are positive, they invest. And the low rate of profit, expectations are low, they don't invest. And this has actually been empirically confirmed by the people who gave us the piece of nonsense known as the efficient markets hypothesis of all people, doing empirical work into the relationship between debt and investment. This is Famer and French. And they concluded in, a, in, a, in an empirical research paper that debt is the residual variable in investment decisions. They said investment increases debt and profit reduces it. Okay? So they said the rate of change of debt is investment minus profits. And then investment itself depends upon the rate of profit. So with a high rate of profit, investment will exceed profits. With a low rate of investment, profit, investment will be less than profits. In the former case, you take on more debt. In the latter case, you pay the debt you have down. So I simply add that to the model here. And you'll now see what I've got is, as well as having the capital to output, to employment, to wages relationship, I've also got interest over here. And that's saying given a rate of profit, you then have a rate at which you'll change the level of debt you have in this the economy. You then have to multiply debt by the interest rate to work out what interest payments you have to pay. And I'm also making it possible to vary the initial conditions in this model. So I'm going to start with reasons I'll explain in a moment, with a, with a very, with a lower level, initial population level, which is just a way of manipulating the initial unemployment level. And just to make sure the system can be seen in reasonable time, I'll run it, say, one year every five seconds, oh, well, five years every one second. If I simulate this model, now looking at the rate of growth, and notice the rate of growth is even more um, you know, up and rapidly down than it was in the previous model. What I've got though is wages going, wages, the share that workers are getting in the employment rate cycling, but obviously heading towards an equilibrium. Okay, the system is converging to an equilibrium. And so is the level of debt. In fact, what I'm getting in this model is negative debt, in which in this model implies a positive bank balance for firms. And that's, it's going to be, come out being roughly equal to annual GDP, so it comes out of being roughly a number of one, which is saying the amount of money firms have accumulated is about one year's worth of, of GDP. So this is a model which, if you're close to the equilibrium, it's stable. This is now the beginnings of the Minsky model. I'll simply add it into that cyclical model of capitalism that Goodwin gave us. The fact that firms invest depending upon the rate of profit, and when the desire to invest exceeds the amount of money they've actually made as profit, they've got to borrow money from the banks. Okay? So it's a very, again, a structural way of bringing Minsky's model in, where Minsky said this sort of system can break down. Now, clearly it doesn't break down. That's heading towards an equilibrium output level, rate of growth, etc., etc., all nice and stable. But I'm going to change the initial conditions where population starts from. And what I want you to take a look at is the debt to output ratio over here. I'll run that again. Uh, at a stable level and focus just upon the debt to output ratio. And you get a series of cycles and debt, debt to output which first of all goes positive, so banks are now owing about 60% of GDP, which is actually the level that firms are currently operating at. But then, through the booms and the slumps, they're paying their debt down and actually getting to the stage where they have a effectively positive bank balance, negative debt. Now I'm going to change this so the system is exactly the same except starting with a different number of workers and therefore a different unemployment rate. And let's take a look at the dynamics this time round for the level of debt. And you can see debt is ratcheting up in a series of humps over time. Looks like it's stabilising at about 200% of GDP, sort of. And what's going on here? 
you're getting bigger and bigger dooms in the amount of debt being taken on, bigger and bigger cycles. And if I keep on going for long enough, you get a total breakdown. So firms are too euphoric here about the amount of investment they'll take on. That ratcheting up effect I mentioned yesterday, where they borrow, they borrow money during booms, have to repay during slumps, and then they, the whole process starts again. Each time it starts, it starts from a higher level of debt, and ultimately you get a total breakdown of the economy. The amount of debt taken on is more than the economy can finance, and it collapses. If I show you the employment, what's happening with employment, then you get employment ultimately plunging. So that's a very stylized version of what we've gone through most recently. I, if I had 10 hours, I could, but I've only got the short time. So we'll, we'll talk about that over, over a drink, if you like. But it's showing one thing about complex systems. And this is one thing, again, economists don't understand. Because they work with this linear behavior, belief about how systems function, they think that a system must head towards equilibrium, because if it doesn't, it'll break down in the sense that you'll get ridiculous values for systems. But a complex system can have cycles without breaking down, which is the first bit I showed you or it can go to another state where you do get chaos and breakdown. And that's what's actually going on there. So complex systems have much richer behaviours than economists understand are possible for, um, for mathematical models. Now, what I've shown you is, is, a, is a model of Minsky that's implicit, with, it doesn't have real money, it's implicitly got money in, both in terms of having debt there, but I don't actually have cash circulating. And what I've been trying for my whole academic career is to get to the point where I literally have a strictly monetary model of capitalism. So I've managed to do that. And the link between the two systems is fundamentally the price system. So what I bring in, and again, if I had lots of time, I think I'd better start winding down here. To have yeah, yeah. What, pr what prices fundamentally do is enable the physical surplus in production to be turned and turned into a monetary profit. And what I, when I work out into a price equation, I start from the argument of saying that if you're going to have equilibrium applying in the system, that means the flow of new demand in terms of physical units being demanded per unit of time would be equal to the physical flow of supply per unit of time. Working through those equations, I finally conclude that the price is going to be a markup on the monetary cost of production, where that markup reflects the, sh the amount of output going to capitalists. Okay. So prices are a markup on the cost of production. That's very simple, but it actually works in a dynamic model. Economists don't think it can function. Uh, I can show you the algebra to show that it does. So I then bring in prices adjusting, explicitly trying to reach equilibrium, as neoclassicals think it, they do. That they do but in a dynamic framework where you have prices being set out of equilibrium and then see what happens. So that's what's being done in this rather more complicated model here. Let's just uh, get that out of the way. So now what I've got is the Minsky model I've shown you with strict, uh, explicitly with money. So I now can talk about inflation, deflation, et cetera, et cetera. And I define those, by the way, change of consumer prices. I'm not using the definition Nicole suggested yesterday. And I'll debate that with Nicole uh, when I see her again. She doesn't seem to be here. She's gone. Uh, so this is now a, a complete monetary model of Minsky. And I'll bring up the second graph here. And one thing I'll... I'd better start with the prelude is that I... When I did my first model of Minsky and I got that effect of a period of cycles leading to breakdown, when I did the first model, the cycles started off very extreme and then stabilised and then started to grow again on the other side and leading to breakdown. And at the end of the first paper I wrote about, I, there was chaotic dynamics behind that, and it's actually called the inverse tangent route to chaos. But I then wrote a little rhetorical flourish saying that the chaotic dynamics in this paper should warn us against regarding a period of stability in capitalist economy as anything other than a lull before the storm. Thank God I was rhetorical, because that's exactly what happened, because you had what neoclassical economists called the great moderation when the rate, rates of inflation and unemployment appeared to be heading down, both of them heading down to a nice stable equilibrium, and they started congratulating themselves for bringing about what they called the great moderation, courtesy of their really wonderful monetary policy. You'll find papers by Ben Bernanke saying pretty much precisely that. From my point of view, this was just the lull before the storm, and what they were ignoring 
was the rising ratio of debt to GDP, which would eventually cause a breakdown. Well, this model actually generates both the Great Moderation and the Great Depression that we're now in, in a more extreme form, because I don't allow bankruptcy in this model. You really need bankruptcy to get capitalism out of a depression. So in this particular situation, when you, go, when, you, when you have more money than you re can repay, the bank just keeps on compounding the debt. So the debt goes exponential. It doesn't have the potential to turn down in, as, it, as, it, uh, as it can in um, an actual economy. Well, let's simulate this one. And if you're a neoclassical economist, you'd be looking in the top left-hand graph and saying, look, unemployment and inflation are both cycling down. Isn't it great our monetary policy is working? And growth is getting more stable. The rate of growth and the rate of profit are both stabilising. And workers are getting less wages, but who cares about them anyway? What you're ignoring is what's happening over here. Rising level of debt compared to GDP. Nominal debt being paid down, but the GDP falling faster below you. You're no longer in a great moderation, you're now in a great depression. And I'll run that more slowly again, it's very fast like that. Let's start it again. Let's stop, rewind and play it again. So those cycles in, in employment and work and inflation, yes, they're dampening. What's happening over here though, is the ratio of debt to GDP is slowly rising and the blue line goes through the red line, which means you've got 100% of GDP as your debt level and then up here, 120, 130, 140. Debt continuing to rise with that ratcheting up effect that I mentioned earlier in the other model and getting to the stage ultimately where it can't be serviced by the firms as well as paying wages. They're accumulating more debt to pay the debt they currently owe. And you then get GDP starting to decline while the debt continues to rise. Ultimately, they do manage to start paying the nominal amount of debt down, but GDP is falling faster, so the ratio goes through the roof and you're in a Great Depression. In this particular system, because there's no bankruptcy, there's no way out, goodbye capitalism. Now, again, this is a stylized model, but again, that's the sort of behaviour we see on a periodic basis. When I showed you that debt to GDP ratios for America, that's what we had in the Great Depression, we got out of it. We let the bankers out of the cage again after the 1945 period. They got us back into debt. We're back in the same dilemma once more. Now, that, um, the crashes fundamentally in the real model, this is a stylized model again, the crashes come down to Ponzi schemes because the only way to talk into taking on that much debt is to get us to borrow money not for the basis of income but for the basis of speculation on asset prices. And that is, when you borrow that money, that is unproductive. If you borrow money and gamble on assets prices, you're not increasing the productive capacity of the economy and therefore you will lead to a crash. But if you, if you borrow money and it's investing, it'll lead to cycles, but it won't necessarily lead to a crash. And that's why I think we've got to constrain the willingness the public has, both households and corporations, to take on debt and restrain that to taking on for income related purposes rather than taking it on for gambling and speculation on asset prices. And that'll do me. It's your crash course. <laughs>